You know, uh, uh, for you guys, I, I, first of all, I want you to know this. We're going through the whole Bible. So don't worry if you're, it's your first time. We'll catch you up. We're going through the book of Genesis all the way through the apocalypse. We're in the, we're in the uh, minor prophets. And all that means is that they didn't write as much as the major prophets. And a prophet is a person that God spoke to to give the king of Israel or Judah, the northern or the southern kingdom in Israel, a message from God. He would say, I have a message from God, and this is what he would tell, and he would tell the priests, he would tell the people, this is what's going on, this is how God is thinking, this is how God is feeling. And it's your responsibility to, to deal with it. And the minor prophets, and Micah was, was written around 700 B.C., uh, Micah wrote to the common people in Judea. That would be the southern kingdom, only two tribes. And uh, you can find his information in the book of Kings. So for you guys that are, are new to reading the Bible, uh, when you finish First and Second Kings, you've basically finished in the timeline of the Old Testament. That's it. Because we have the poetical books in Isaiah and the prophets, which were all written during the kings because the prophets were telling the kings what God was saying, what he was wanting to do. So when we look at uh, Micah, it was written around 700 B.C. during the time of 2 Kings chapter 16, 2 through 4, 2 Kings 18, 13 through 19:36, to those kings, okay, this is the prophet. And... We, we all have learned, for you guys that have been here, that the greatest, one of the greatest faults of Israel and Judea was social missteps, social miscues. We call it social injustice. But they were not living according to the rules, the boundaries, the laws that God set up for all of humanity. See, when they were obedient to God, they took care of each other. They said, this is sin, this is right, this is justice, this is unjustice. This is taking the resources that God gave us and making sure the widows, the poor, the needy are taken care of. When we looked at Obadiah, we said, here's the deal, pride comes before the fall. And their pride welled up so much that the Edomites thought, First of all, I live on a mountain, mountain, nobody can whoop me, nobody can beat me. And uh, their pride said, I am, I am not going to be obedient to God, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And they did, and uh, they were destroyed by God. And so uh, a, a close friend of mine said, you know, those of us that grew up in the 60s and 70s and dealt with these social issues during Vietnam War, end of the Vietnam War, during, uh, I, I lived right outside Chicago during Martin Luther King, all his stuff that was going on between the blacks and the whites, you know, and all these social issues, God already took care of those when he wrote the law. And he said, listen, you are my chosen people, and you need to learn how to understand how to take care of everybody. The church is not Israel. There's a distinct distinction between the church and Israel. But there is no distinction between how God wants you and I to live and how he doesn't want us to live. And we are all to be socially just. But we are to say this is sin, this is not, this is right, this is wrong. In Micah, we see once again that the problem is that same problem that they have, we have. The same problem they had and all the other prophets they had, and that was this. Well, let, let's read some of this, starting at uh, Micah chapter 1, verse 1. <clears throat> Thanks, Mike. The Lord gave this message to Micah of Mezareth during the year when Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah were kings in Judah. The vision he saw concerned both Samaria and, Jer and Jerusalem. Attention. Let all the people of the world listen. Let the earth and everything in it hear. The sovereign Lord is making accusations against you. The Lord speaks from his holy temple. Look, the Lord is coming. He leaves his throne in heaven and tramples the heights of the earth. The mountains melt beneath his feet and flow into the valleys like wax in a fire, like water pouring down a hill. 
And why is this happening? Because of the rebellion of Israel? Yes, the saints of the whole nation who is to blame for Israel's, to, for Israel's rebe rebellion. Samaria, its capital city. Where is, the center, where is the center of idolatry in Judah? In Jerusalem, its capital. So I, the Lord, will make the city of Samaria a heap of ruins. Her streets will be blown up, blowed up for planting vineyards. I will roll the stones for her walls into the valley below, exposing her foundations. All her carved image will be smashed. All her sacred treasure will be burned. These things were, brought, were bought with the money earned by her prostitution, and they will now be carried away to pay prostitution elsewhere. Therefore, or in conclusion, verse 8, I will mourn and lament. I will talk around... Excuse me, I will walk around barefoot and naked. I will howl like a jackal and moan like an owl. For my people's wound is too deep to heal. It, was, it has reached into Judah, even at the gates of Jerusalem. Don't tell our enemies in Gath, don't weep at all. Your people in Beth Leprar roll the dust to show their despair. Your, you people in Shephar go as, go as captives into exile, naked and ashamed. The people of Zanon dare not come outside their walls. The people of Bethsareel mourn for those, for their houses, for their houses has no support. The people of Maroth anxiously wait for relief, but only bitterness awaits them as the Lord, as the Lord's judgment reaches even to the gates to the gates of Jerusalem. Harness your chariot horses and flee, you people of Lachish. You were the first city in Judah to follow Israel in her rebellion. And you led Jerusalem into sin. Send farewell gifts to Morath's Gath. There is no hope of saving it. The town of wherever that is has deceived the king of Israel. O people of Marsha, I will bring a conqueror to capture your town. And the leaders of Israel go to Adalim. O people of Judah, shave your heads in sorrow. For the children you love will be snatched away. Make yourself as bald as a vulture, and your little ones will be exiled to distant lands. It goes on and on and on. And, you know, to be a prophet, uh, even not to write a lot, basically, you know, it's like, you guys, you forgot to do what is right. You forgot to do what you were supposed to do. And as for you guys that have, have read the Minor Prophets or looked at the Prophets, we all understand and we realize that even today it's the same. How many of you guys have experienced the goodness of God? Just raise your hand. How many of you guys have just experienced and just go, man, God, you have been good, so, so good. And then how many of you guys two weeks later forgot the goodness of God? Yeah, isn't that the way it is? I, I mean, I wish it wasn't. I wish we, in our maturity, because, you know, maturity means we grow in our mind, in our, our emotions, we grow up, and, and we shouldn't forget the sweetness things, the sweetnesses of, of our lives. Some of you guys couldn't even remember the time you got your first kiss. You know, it's hard for me to fathom. For me, it was really a big deal. But the reality is this. We experience the goodness of God. You know? We should remember that when there's beautiful days, you know, when we have beautiful days in Montana, the Great Falls, and there's no wind, and it's like 85 degrees, and you don't know where you're at. We don't go, oh, God, this is cool. I'm so glad you gave us this day. We don't think about that because it's just like, wow, this is amazing. Well, maybe you do. But most of the time when things are good, we don't, sweat anything it's when it's sub-zero and we go dear god help me save enough money to move to san diego when things go bad that's when we consider god but when things are good which is it's all good somehow the children of israel and the children of judah life would be going good and then they would forget why how it's so good. They forget that God is good to them. And just as Obadiah taught those people, he said, pride 
comes before the fall because you think you made it all right and you did not. It was God. It is God. It is God. There's uh, three points in the book of Micah that uh, um, um, uh, uh, Mike, if you would turn to uh, uh, Micah chapter 6. I want to read a few more of these verses because there's p- three points on how to how to live a life that is pleasing to God. There's three things that you can remember on how to live a life that's pleasing to God. Okay, but let's as we get up to that point, let's read Micah chapter 6. Stand up and state your case against, against me. Let the mountains and the hills be called to witness your complaints. And now, O mountains, listen to the Lord's complaint. He has a case against his people. He will bring charges against Israel. Oh, my people, what, are, what have I done to you? What have I done to make you tired of me? Answer me. I brought you out of Egypt. I redeemed you from slavery. I sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to help you. Don't you remember, my people, how King Balak and Moab tried to have you cursed and how Balaam, son of Beor, blessed you instead? And remember your journey from Achaia, the Acacia Grove to Gilgal, when I, the Lord, did everything I could to teach you about my faithfulness? Now, isn't this good? Let's just stop and think of those verses right there. And then make them personal in your life and say, remember the times when God just blessed you, when he took care of you when things weren't going good. You lost your job. You thought you had no future. And then all of a sudden, God opened so many different doors for you. You go, oh, my goodness, God has blessed me. He's blessed me, my wife, my kids. It's amazing. But you get so long in your own careers, and you go, oh, I'm so glad I made those decisions. Like, God had nothing to do with it. See, because that's the problem with Israel and Judah. They go, oh, well, God had nothing to do with it. And so God is, the Lord is saying, how can you forget these monstrous moments in your life that I have blessed you with? Why do you forget them? And that's, that's what he's telling them is why, why do you forget them? You know, and remember your journey, verse, uh, halfway through verse 5. And remember your journey from Achaia Grove to Gilgar, when I, the Lord, did everything I could to teach you about my faithfulness. Verse 6. What can we bring to the Lord? What kind of offering should we give him? Should we bow before God with offerings of yearlings, calves? Uh, should we offer him thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our first child, firstborn children to pay for our sins? No. Oh, people, the Lord has told you what is good. And this is what it requires. And this is what it requires to do. There's three things. You can underline these in the Bible. You got the note section in your note page. You should write these down. Because these three things, after he said, after all the rebellion, everything, he goes, here's three things. Because it's like he's saying, listen, you know, it's not the olive oil. It's not how many calves you can bring to the temple to be sacrificed. It's none of that. How to please God. How to be socially just. How to live right. And we should all go, how, how do I live right? And first, first thing he says, he says, uh, he says, first of all, do what is right. Do what is right. You know, um, I really do believe most people know, even if they are not walking close to God, even if they're far from God. They usually know what to do. And they usually know what to do is right. They may choose to step out of bounds, but most of the time they know what is right and what is wrong. Would you guys agree with that? Most of you guys know what's right or wrong. You know, even in even in the, the crazy, sexually screwed up society that we live in, a lot of people that do other things and they will say, well, it's probably not right. They usually admit it, even though, but they go, I want to do it anyways. That's pride, and pride comes before the fall, and that's what happens. Do what's right. What is the best thing about doing what's right? You never have to make anything up. You just do what's right. You know, if you're a businessman, or if you're a businesswoman, and you do what's right, when it comes tax season, you don't have to sweat the IRS, right? You do what's right. Uh, husbands and wives, you do what's right. 
You don't lie. You don't steal. You don't cheat on each other. You just do what's right. And how do you please God? Well, it, it, not only does it please God, but I think it's a blessing to everybody around us. So, one, you do what's right. And then he says to love mercy. Number two, love mercy. You know, mercy, I, I think best described, is somebody takes the hit or somebody doesn't give you the punishment that you deserve. That's mercy. Love mercy. We all love mercy, right? We all, you know, if it wasn't for mercy, we'd, we'd, all, be, we'd all be done. We should love mercy mercy we should do what's right we should love mercy now i i, I want to make something real clear about mercy you don't want to be a fool you know and what i mean by that is you will meet people who just go you know just show me mercy show me mercy give me give me give me show me mercy show me mercy and eventually you go sorry my mercy gland is done There's a new word that they thought of in the 20th century, and they brought it along into the 21st, and we call that enabling. But you know what? Hey, let's let's. If I if I thought about that for a while, how many of you guys have kids and you love your kids? How many of you guys who love your kids, your kids have taken advantage of you? How many of you know that you've been taken advantage of? Do you feel like he nailed them? Ah, oh, heck no. I just love my kids. Right? I mean, you know, when I think of God's love for me, and all the things that I have done to break his heart, to adulterate my relationship with him, he still loves me and he still shows me mercy. That is amazing. That is amazing. How do we please God? We do what's right, and we love mercy. And when we love mercy, we give it our best shot not to be a fool, but to show mercy. But to show mercy. And then uh, um, number three. This is probably uh, all of our greatest attributes is to walk humbly with our God. Pride comes before the fall. So we need to learn how to walk humbly. Humbly before our God. That's a lifelong lesson. Learning how to walk humbly. Not taking the glory because all the glory belongs to God. For you guys that brought your Bible and... Uh, and Michael, turn in on the uh, uh, PowerPoint for us, but uh, Romans chapter 13, starting at verse 8. And if we look at what Paul wrote the church at Rome on how new Christians, not living under the law, but living under grace, how we are to live, I think he restates this very thing that we see in the book of Micah. Romans chapter 13. I think this deals with uh, social justice, how to treat each other, how you and I need to live as men and women who call themselves Christians, you know. Men and women who say, I love God, and we meet other people, and they go, wow, they really do love God. And when we walk humbly, people don't feel less than around us. You know what I'm saying? Have you met other people who say they're a Christian, but when you're around them, you think of the math in the elementary school and you feel less than, not equal to, but less than? See, I don't think we're walking humbly then because I think when we walk humbly, we bring people right alongside us and love them and cherish them and care for them. So I think in Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through the end of 13, let's, let's look at these together. Owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. And uh, 
Solomon told his son, don't be, don't owe anybody anything, you know. So basically he's saying, give it your best shot to live debt free. The only thing you should owe is, is to love each other. So accept your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fill the requirements of the law. Isn't that good? The Edomites did not love their neighbors. The Judea, Judah, they, they, they got lost along the way. Israel got lost along the way. And so many times you and I get lost along the way and we forget how to love each other. We forget how to do what's right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. So owe nothing to anyone except your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fill, fulfill the requirements of God's law. For the commandments say you must not commit adultery, you must not commit murder, you must not steal, you must not covet. These and other such commandments are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to others, so love fulfills the requirements of the law. Isn't that just unbelievable? You know, we can sum up all three with, God, with love. You know, is it an oshi goshi thing, Valentine's Day coming up? Yeah, it kind of is. It kind of is, but that's what God says, love each other. I was talking to a, um, a couple that I met, and um, they, don't, they don't go to church here. Anyways, uh, she was a part of a ministry for, for years, and she goes, you know, I never felt loved. As a matter of fact, I, very, I felt lonely when I went to church. And I'm like, wow, that is just bizarre. And I go, you know, because as Christians, shouldn't we be loving people? Yeah, right? Shouldn't we be loving people? I, I mean, you know, I think if people love God and you love God, you should be able to love other people. You know, we're not Jesus though, right? So if you tick me off, I, I, I'm not Jesus. I might not love you. He'll love you, but I may struggle with that, right? You know, we were talking to someone in our leadership meeting this morning about, you know, you know, a lot of times people go to church and sometimes we think that when we get there, everybody's going to think they're better or they should all be like Jesus and just be perfect. We're not. Look at the person next to you and say, you're not perfect. Oh, give it a shot. You've been wanting to do this all day. You know what I'm saying? Hey, honey, you're not perfect just in case you forgot. Anyways, let's finish this up. This is all the, verse 11 of, of Romans 13. This is, all the, this is all the more urgent, for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up, for our, our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. Isn't that good? You know, I, I always, whenever I, I, I hear that, I always think of, you know, taking off your filthy, foul clothes, whatever those things are, just take them off and put on right living, put on cleanness, you know? Do what is right, because that's what he's saying. Just do what is right. Um, verse 13, because we belong to the day we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties, drunkenness, sexual promiscuity, immoral living, quarreling, and jealousy. I mean, doesn't that cover every modern day sin that goes on within and without of the evangelical churches in the world, right? I mean, you know, immorality. Don't tell anybody, but I do it. Sexual sin, no. Promise, no. Here's what God says. That's dirty, it's dirty, it's dirty, it's dirty, it's dirty. It's going to soil your life. It's going to soil your soul. So stay away from it. Drunkenness, stay away. It'll lead you down those sexual immoral roads. Stay away. And, you know, I, I get a kick out of it because this was written, you know, 60 AD, 70 AD. 
And we had the problems then. 700 B.C., we still had the problems. So, you know. And, I, and I, first of all, chapter 13, verse 13. I love this because we belong to the day. Gosh. Isn't it so important to sometimes just take life one day at a time? I don't know what tomorrow holds. God does. I might have screwed up yesterday. So let me live today rightly. You know, let me, let me do justice. Let me walk humbly today. Not sure what's going to happen tomorrow, but let me do this today. Because we belong to today, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in darkness of wild parties, drunkenness, sexual problems, community, immoral living, or a quarreling jealousy. So just stop. And, and then he says, instead, you know, instead, instead. Because he doesn't want you to walk around naked. He says, here, you've got to put some clothes on. This is what you need to put on, he says. Instead, close yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. Chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 of Romans says this. Because all the, all the battles that we have in our spiritual lives are right in our, right in our mind, right? It's in our mind. That's where we fight this, the devil. That's where everything happens. And so just further, right before that, he says, So dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. acceptable. This truly is the way to worship him. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world. And if you've never underlined these words in your Bible, take out a marker. If you never wrote them down, write it in the, uh, uh, on the note paper. It says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. By changing the way you think. Because he would say, I want you to think to do what is right. I will want you to think of mercy and I would want you to consider how to walk humbly, how to walk humbly before our God.